In an alternative universe, everyone tells the truth all the time, with no exceptions. People say exactly what they think and feel, which often leads to awkward or uncomfortable situations. Mark Bellison, a chubby, struggling screenwriter in his 40s, is on his way to pick up his date. He walks around in twists and turns trying to find her unit inside a luxury apartment building. He finally finds her apartment and knocks on the door and a beautiful woman opens it. Since humans have no reservations on telling the truth, however absurd and straightforward, the woman tells Mark he is early and she just started masturbating. Mark immediately replies that it now makes him think of her private parts and follows it by introducing himself and asking her how she's doing. She tells him that she's a little frustrated at the moment and also equally depressed and pessimistic about their date tonight before she tells him her name, Anna. She then invites Mark to come in. Anna hurries upstairs and tells Mark to wait for her on the sofa as she needs to finish getting ready and while doing that she might realize she's still horny and try to finish masturbating without him hearing. Mark is left alone as he looks around and sits down on the sofa to wait on her. Mark tries to strike a conversation and says he's embarrassed because he thinks the restaurant he made reservations at may not be expensive enough for her because it was all he could afford in his situation. He further elaborates that he knows he's in his 40s, but he has no real financial assets to speak of and his boss told him he's going to get fired this week as Anna walks down the stairs smiling. Mark stands up from the sofa as Anna tells him she just masturbated, to which he immediately replies that makes him horny and he hopes the date ends in sex. Anna straightforwardly tells him she doesn't find him attractive and hurriedly asks if they could go. Mark agrees and stands up as Anna grabs her purse as they continue to leave the apartment. At the restaurant, Anna's phone rings and she answers her mom on the other end of the line. She continues to talk to her and blatantly tells her in front of Mark's face that he's not attractive, doesn't make much money, a bit fat with a funny little snub nose, but is kind of funny and nice. She continues to tell her she won't be sleeping with him tonight nor even give him a kiss before she ends the phone call. Their dinner date ends with three empty margarita glasses in front of Anna as the waiter hands over the bill and asks her if she would call him if he gives her his number, to which Anna says no. The next scene shows the two stopping by Anna's apartment building as Mark thanks Anna for going on a date with him. He reiterates that he knows she is way out of his league and went out with him only as a favor to her friend, Greg, and that most likely he will never hear from her again. Anna responds by telling him that she actually had a better time than she thought she'd have, but won't know for sure how she feels about him until she's less drunk. Mark cheerfully tells her to call him tomorrow if she still likes him when she's sober, to which Anna replies that she might. Mark leans in for a kiss, but Anna kisses him on the cheek and goes inside. Mark happily thanks her for the kiss as Anna waves goodbye. The next morning, Mark wakes up and goes to work. He finally reaches the office building and as he goes, a group of people is being led by a tour guide and sees Mark passing through and introduces him as one of their very own screenwriters. The whole tour turns towards Mark and he turns around and dejectedly waves but the tour guide adds that Mark is one of their least successful writers before saying he's also heard he's most likely getting fired today. After a long and awkward exchange of hurtful truth and blatant pleasantries with his receptionist, Shelley, Mark's worst and most anticipated fear finally happens. He was fired from his job by his reluctant boss, who was afraid of confrontations. He was fired because his films on the 1300s were boring and had minimal appeal to audiences. Before leaving with his work stuff, he is humiliated by Brad Kessler, a very attractive man and one of the most successful screenwriters in lecture films. He further insults Mark by telling him he's always hated him and elaborates that Mark was a crappy writer assigned to a crappy century. But he also says that he was always threatened by Mark because he knew there was something about him that he didn't understand. Brad then storms off after telling him to enjoy his loser life. Mark deliberately leaves in shame. The following morning, Mark wakes up to his usual 7.30 a.m. alarm and hard knocks on his door by his landlord, asking him for his rent. He then tries to reason with the landlord that he got fired from work and he has only $300 left in his bank account, but the landlord still insisted he pay the entire $800 or move out. Drowning in shame and desperation, Mark goes to the bank to close his account and take whatever money is left. 
The teller then tells him their system is down at the moment and asks him the amount of money he wants to withdraw. At the peak of his despair, something suddenly comes over him. His face turns a light shade of red as the wheels begin to spin in his brain. Suddenly, he looks at the teller dead in her eyes. The teller asks him again, sir, to which he immediately replies, $800. The system comes back up again and the teller tells him he only has $300 in his account. Mark doesn't know what to say. He tries to speak, but nothing comes out. In a sudden twist of fate, the teller apologizes to Mark and tells him it seems their system had made a mistake and proceeds to give him $800 in large bills as Mark requested. Mark nervously walks out of the bank and smiles cheerfully when he realizes what he just did. Mark finally discovered lying and got away with it. He then proceeds to give his rent to his confused landlord who asks him where he got the money and he lies by telling him he just found the money lying on the street. The next day, Mark is at the bar having drinks with his friend Greg as he tries to explain to him what he just discovered, or in his own words, invented. Mark is having a difficult time looking for the right word to explain exactly what he meant, so he just told Greg he said something that wasn't. Greg shrugs as he obviously doesn't know what a lie is. Mark, still frustrated by his inability to explain, decides to experiment by making up a lie to Greg and the bartender, telling them his name is Doug, to which the two believe without hesitation. Mark, even more frustrated, then proceeds to tell more lies, including telling them he's black, he's an Eskimo, he's a pirate, a lion tamer with a wig, that he invented the bicycle, and lastly, a one-armed German explorer. Greg and the bartender believed and justified all of those lies, which made Mark even more disappointed. Mark then asks the bartender and Greg what they would do if they could make the world the way they wanted them to be, including the ability to do anything and everything. Greg and the bartender unanimously answer that they would want to touch women's boobs and have sex with them. Mark hesitantly agrees as he stands up and walks out of the bar. Mark walks the street like a hunter looking for his prey. Within seconds, he spots a gorgeous blonde walking right towards him. The blonde walks past him, but after a long pause, Mark shouts at her to wait and proceeds to blurt out that the world is going to end if they don't have sex right now. The terrified woman helplessly agrees and they go to the nearest motel, which isn't even necessary if the world really is going to end. But before anything happens, Mark is bothered by his conscience and eventually fakes a phone call to NASA and tells the woman the world is not going to end and everyone is safe. This never ever heard of art of lying marked the beginning of Mark's career as a liar, using it to take advantage of every situation he finds himself in. He prevented a police officer from arresting his friend Greg for drunk driving while they were on their way to the casino to make money by cheating. He did this by basically telling the officer that Greg was not drunk and the officer believed him right away. Inside the casino, Mark proceeds with his devious plan to get rich. He starts to cheat at the roulette table by replacing his bets on the winning number to which the dealer automatically agrees. He then proceeds to the slot machines and informs the casino manager he won a major jackpot but no money came out. The manager instantly apologizes to him and congratulates him on his winnings. Mark and Greg, each carrying four giant buckets overflowing with chips and money, then waddle through the casino as Greg remarks that this has been the most amazing night of his life, to which Mark agrees. Later on, Mark has an enlightening conversation with his neighbor, Frank, who told him he might end his life that night. Mark eventually saves him by telling him not to do it and that everything will be okay, he will meet someone soon and he will be happy. Mark soon discovers that lying could be used for good. Mark then starts to do good deeds throughout the day. He helped a homeless man get money from the bank. Outside lecture films, Mark talks to the woman who was adamant about not wanting to go to work. He whispers a few words into her ear. She smiles, picks up the briefcase, and gladly walks to work. He helps an arguing couple reconcile at the coffee shop. Mark is at the elderly home, walking the halls and whispering to his grandmother and each elderly person he passes, leaving each one of them with a smile upon their faces and some with tears streaming down their cheeks. 
And finally, later that night, Mark hangs out with Frank at his apartment by having some beers and having a great time watching TV. One night, after convincing Anna to go out with him again on the phone, Mark chanced upon a lecture film's documentary in which the narrator openly says that no one writes a better documentary than Brad Kessler. This gave Mark the inspiration to write a new screenplay about the 14th century being invaded by aliens that ended with the assertion that everyone's memories had been erased. He finishes the script and pitches it to his old boss and to everyone at Lecture Films. Everyone loved it, including Brad Kessler. Mark and his film become a big blockbuster. He is now rich and famous beyond his wildest dreams. Despite all of this and also having convinced Anna to go out on a date with him again, he is still rejected by her as she was still not attracted to him due to his genetics and appearance. And during their date, Mark receives a phone call. His mom just had a fatal heart attack. In another turning point of his life, Mark rushes into the hospital room to find his mother Martha, who is looking tired and scared while hooked up to dozens of machines. She tells Mark that she's scared of dying and the eternal nothingness that it brings. Teary-eyed and not knowing what to do, Mark tells her that she's wrong about the eternity of nothingness. He then proceeds to tell her of all the good things after death, including mansions for everyone, being able to be with all the people she loved and loved her. He also tells her that she will be young again and there will be no sadness nor pain, only love, laughing, and happiness. Martha soon passes away with a tear of glimmering hope rolling down her face. After some time of mourning, Mark's supposed knowledge about death made him famous worldwide. As it turns out, the nurses at the hospital when Martha died have heard about the things he told her and the news spread quickly like wildfire. People start to gather around him seeking answers about the afterlife and he becomes something of a prophet or a religious figure. And with encouragement from Anna, Mark comes up with 10 rules or commandments for living a good life and securing a place in the good afterlife. He claims to talk to a man in the sky who controls everything and promises great rewards in the afterlife as long as you do no more than three bad things. This televised event made Mark a global phenomenon and started a sort of religion among his followers. In spite of all the fame and success he earned, Mark is still conflicted by his own happiness and his gift for lying. During a date at the park with Anna, she asked him if being rich and famous would make their children more physically attractive. Despite his urge to lie, Mark did not do it because of his love for Anna and told her it wouldn't. As a result, Anna continued dating Mark's rival, Brad Kessler, who was jealous of Mark's success. Brad's selfish and cruel behavior, including restricting her diet, made Anna uncomfortable, but she still agreed to marry him. After a long while, we see Mark waking up one morning in his mansion with a sort of biblical long hair and beard. Anna walks in, tells him she's busy with work, and adds that she came over to tell him she's getting married and hands him his invitation. Mark waves it away and pleads with her not to do it. Anna tells him the wedding is tomorrow and would like him to come. Mark asks her why and she says it would make her happy and being around him makes her happy. Mark quickly asks her, then why are you marrying him? Anna tells him she only has a few years to marry someone with good genes and financial stability so she can have children and the family she has always wanted. She also adds that one day she'll be old and wrinkly and ugly. Mark quickly tells her she won't be, not to him, and she will never be ugly. Anna is teary-eyed and doesn't know how to reply to what he just said. She tells him he's confusing her. After a few moments, Anna asks him to take the invitation, which Mark accepts, and bids her have a nice life as she starts to cry and walk out of the mansion. Later that day at the park, Anna sees a chubby boy enjoying ice cream, which reminded her of what her and Mark's kids would look like since half of the kids' genetics would come from Mark. The boy was later bullied for being fat by the other kids, to which Anna interfered. She then consoles the boy and tells him he is so much more than being short and fat despite being called Short Fat Brian. She calls him just Brian with a great smile. The morning before the wedding, Greg convinced Mark that he still had a chance with Anna. Mark attended Anna and Brad's wedding where he objected to the marriage but was told that only the man in the sky could stop it. Brad and Anna asked Mark to ask the man in the sky what Anna should do, but he refused, wanting Anna to make the decision for herself. 
Anna walked out and Mark confessed his ability to lie. Anna struggled to understand the concept but eventually professed her love for him. In the end, Anna and Mark are shown having dinner as a happily married couple with a son who seemed to have inherited his father's ability to lie. The chubby snot-nosed boy clearly exhibits this gift by telling Anna their meal is good even if he and his father knows it is not. Mark then teases his son to finish his food and tells Anna their son loves it. And that's a wrap for this movie recap. Thank you for watching.